I just speak now. Uh, good evening. Uh, we're going to start before we have a prayer and get into Bible class. Is uh, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. If you're following along, that's 405. O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We'll sing all three verses. Um, Please, with all the doctors that are tending to those individuals, that they can recuperate their health and get back to a, a new state of living. And please be with all of us as we continue to go through our lives. Help us to stay safe and to continue to glorify you. Most of all, we're grateful for your son and the sacrifice that he paid. Please help us always to live a better lives for him and lives that are that are reflections of an example of who he is. Please help us in this time of study to study your Bible and your word carefully, that we can gain something from it, not just for our edification, but that we can use to help others. Thank you for your son. It's in your name prayer. Amen. Good evening. Good to see everyone tonight. Certainly glad you are with us. I apologize for not being here Sunday. I knew I wasn't going to be here Sunday morning, but we ran into a little bit of difficulty Sunday afternoon and decided to take a little drive across the state of Kentucky twice. So we saw Kentucky like nobody's seen Kentucky before. Maybe Stacy's seen Kentucky like that, driving back and forth. But 
It's good for you to be here. It's good for all of us to be here. We're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel. I passed out some introduction material and some things in chapter 1. We won't be getting into chapter 1 uh, for a few minutes, but we're going to learn some basic things about the book of Ezekiel. If you're watching online, you can go to our website, uh, www.sunrise-church-of-christ.org. At the top of the thing, we'll say blog. Tap on the word blog at the top of the um, screen, and that will pull down all of today's notes. They're on there, so a place I can stick them on there quickly. Um, also, there's questions. Uh, questions are not on the internet yet, but I can put those on the internet tonight. Um, and so you can download those from the internet if you like. So I know people have requested questions, and so I have answered your prayers. Whoever, the, whoever you are with requested questions. So we should have those through every, uh, through every chapter of the book. So when we look at the introduction material, uh, the name Ezekiel means God strengthens, or one writer who's expressing the, Lord's, the Lord toughens. Um, so we'll be looking at the personality of the preacher, Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, apparently his name was intended to be uh, the strength that he would need for the task assigned by God, by Jehovah, which demonstrated in carrying out his sacred responsibilities. You see some verses there. Um, he was a Levite. He was born in the tribe of Levi. Who else was born in the tribe of Levi? Anybody? Probably. I was thinking Paul. He was a tribe of Benjamin, wasn't he? But uh, anyway, so he was a born of the tribe of Levi, and he was a priest. Um, by the way, the first six questions are answered in your at least you know, six to ten questions are answered in the introduction. If you're looking for answers uh, to the questions, the son of uh, Buzzy, and we don't know anything else of the father of Ezekiel. Uh, sometimes the greatest distinction one can have is in the children who serve. God Almighty. So we know absolutely nothing about the Father other than his name, but we know so much about Ezekiel uh, the prophet. Now, Ezekiel is a prophet. In the Bible, we have what kind of prophets? Big ones and little ones, major and minor, we call them. What's the difference? In their popularity, maybe? No, I'll share. In the length of the book, um, this the qualifications there were pretty much made up by man. Those aren't made up by God. We've separated major prophets and minor prophets when when we put the books in certain orders. And he said, "Oh, Jonah has six chapters, so six or four. What do you guys preach on Jonah? Six or four? This is four. Anyway, Jonah has four chapters, so he's a minor prophet." Um, Ezekiel has over 40, so he's a major prophet. So um, we see that there. But there's so much involved in Ezekiel. There's no uh, indication that he had formally functioned as a priest in Jerusalem. However, Ezekiel grew up in uh, Judea in the declining days of Hebrew independence and was transported to Babylon along with King, uh, King Jeho Jehoiachin in 597 B.C. with 10,000 other captives. We see that in 7 Kings. Uh, chapter 24, verses 10 through 16. So we're dealing with a time period, 597 B.C., where um, Israel, or, or the Jewish people, are being punished for sin, or about to be punished for sin. And, th and Ezekiel is a prophet prophesying to a people that need one word, really, repentance. And so Ezekiel is a book really about two things. It's about to see how glorifying God is, how wonderful God is. And we'll see that especially throughout the descriptions of chapter 1 as we get into some of the other chapters. Um, when we think of God, we think of, oh, God is God and, and that type of thing. But Ezekiel really brings out the character of God. And that God is a mighty being and a supreme being and, and it kind of lifts him up there. And that is really what we see through the prophet Ezekiel. We also see that other word, repent. 
because God is so glorious and so mighty and so wonderful, when we find ourselves in sin, what should we do? Repent. And that repenting, of course, as we understand, as we know, if it's a turning direction from the way we live a life. If, if we understand that, that to touch this red cloth up here is a sin, Okay, so what do I have to do to repent from that? Well, first of all, I have to refrain from touching that red cloth again. Secondly, I should apologize, if you will, to God. I, or confess that, if you will, to God. I confess my sins to my God. I confess that I have. Does God know that I touched the red cloth? Absolutely. He's, he's om, omnipresent, omniscient, and, and he knows these things, and we'll see that part of his glory in the book of Ezekiel, how he is, but also he wants us to just say, hey, and it's kind of like a child confessing to their parents, I did this wrong. Okay, God wants to hear that from us. I did this wrong. I'm sorry I've done this, and I will do everything I can in my power not to touch the red cloth again. But if I should slip up and touch the red cloth, what do I do? I repent again. I keep on trying. So repentance is partly, it's building it, because, you know, when we come out of the baptistry, we don't say, well, I'm never going to drink, I'm never going to smoke, I'm never going to do all these things that I've not done in my previous life. It's a process of learning new behavior learning new behaviors and, and, and steering away from the old behaviors that, that may not be so good for us. So we're looking at this period of 597 B.C. where he was carried into captivity, into Babylonian captivity. Now there is something that we'll see that's protected about things. When we're in this building here, it's a safe zone to preach, isn't it? It's a safe zone to pray. It's a safe zone to sing and, and those types of things. Um, what if we went to the, out in the parking lot and just started singing? That might be a safe zone. Or, or if the neighbor's sitting in his front yard, you might be, what is that horrible noise that's coming over there? Not as safe, because he might not like it. He might, who knows what he might do. But we're in a safe zone here. We don't think twice about it. But when, so when they're in the, their Judea and Jerusalem and those areas, they're in a, a religious safe zone. But what this is all about is taking you out of your religious box, taking you out of your religious safe zone. And how do you feel about going into another zone? We'll take you out and put you in Babylonian and kept in what we'll call captivity. And now you have to worship in a different area where you're not as comfortable, but you still have to honor God. Back to the notes, there was 11 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, this is, you hear me talk often about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That is the second destruction of Jerusalem. This would be the first destruction of Jerusalem when they were called off into Babylonian captivity and the Babylonians would be responsible for that first destruction. Of course, it was rebuilt, part of them coming back uh, into the land. I want you to know, as we get started in the book of Ezekiel, there's the Almighty God, there's repentance, and as long as we have breath in us, there's always hope. There's always hope. And, and so that's kind of at the end of the rainbow there, uh, uh, we, we know this, that our might, almighty God always provides hope for us. And as part of that repentance, if we're willing to turn away from sin and follow God, he provides hope for us. So we'll see some shadows of hope throughout uh, this book. Uh, Ezekiel was in Babylon for five years before Jehovah <clears throat> called him to his prophetic office. So about 592 B.C., he was contemporary with both Daniel and Jeremiah. So what contemporary means is these books are written at the same time. Daniel and Jeremiah, which Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He also writes the book of Lamentations, or it's, Lamentations is he laments over um, really Jerusalem or Israel because of their sin. And, and so we have these uh, things going on at the same time 
with different smaller groups of people, if you will. We know a lot about Daniel. Daniel is uh, Daniel had been deported into Babylon in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim. Uh, we'll see five kings. You know, this is kind of the next page, but we'll see five kings here in Ezekiel's uh, work here that uh, in the book of Ezekiel, his, his prophetic work. So Daniel had been deported. Uh, and Jehoah, King Jehoiakim reigned about 606 to 605 BC. We see that documentation in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, he labored at the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the years about King Nebuchadnezzar. We see that in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, Jeremiah's ministry was in Judah, and it spanned some 40 years from about, about 626 to 576 BC. Um, Ezekiel was married. He had a wife. What do we call her? Mrs. Ezekiel. Because we don't know her name. Um, had a wife. And she was with him. Uh, his, wife, his wife died in the ninth year of captivity. And we see that in Ezekiel chapter 24 verse 18. He had his own house in Babylon. Um, that means something. If you have your own, if you're in captivity and you have your own property, that means you're not at the bottom of the food chain. I remember when they took Israel, or took the, the Jews into captivity, they took them into three different uh, groups of captivity. First, they took the wealthy and the kings and those high up in office. And then as they took the second group, it was lesser of people, and the third group was lesser. And what they left there was pretty much what people would call the peasants. Um, so they, they took them in three different groups over several years. Um, he had his own house and a uh, Apparently was granted considerable latitude in the land. So uh, we see that in chapter 3 and chapter 8. He, he seemed to have been th about 30 years of age when his ministry began. 30 years is interesting. Uh, Jesus did a lot of work at his around 30, 33 years old. Um, several others between the years of 30 and 45 uh, did their work. So those years are, are in particular in the Bible. Many times uh, you're considered a man when you're 40 years old in the Bible. And so they, they certainly, you'll see a lot of prophets did their work about that time. Uh, his writing, or he, his, his written prophecies continued some 22 years, and he received a divine revelation as late as the 27th year of captivity. Um, he seemed to have the respect of the Hebrew elders in the land, and there is no record of his death. So kind of just fades off into, we know he died obviously at some point, we don't know how, how, why, or anything like that. After 27 years of prophecy, it just kind of fades off into the, uh, the backdrop. Okay, one does not travel far into the book before he uh, confronts the reality that much of Ezekiel's message is framed in symbolism. This is important. Much like the book of Revelation that we've been studying on Sunday night, and that's kind of why I picked the book of Ezekiel, this is framed similarly. Uh, pictural images designed to convey spiritual truth. Pictural images. We have a vivid mind, don't we? Uh, I passed out some crayons today and a, a coloring book. Most of us could do something with that, couldn't we? Now, some of us are better artists than others. I'm not a very good artist. I was kicked out of art class in elementary school, pretty much. The teacher looked at me and said, you have absolutely no talent. And that was that. You know, I didn't take that the second year. But uh, I know the boys have good talent. I know some of you all have good talent as artists. If I tell you this, if I do a description of something, you can draw a picture of it. And maybe if I describe a scene, we all draw a picture of it. Every picture may not be exactly the same, but yet we're able to see things in that picture that come alive. And I know we're very picturesque, if you will, because who here doesn't have a television in their home? Everybody has a television, no. I was walking down the aisles of Sam's Club the other day, and the TVs that you would have bought three years ago are antiques now, by the way. 
they have the cheap ones are the 4K. So I remember when 4K just came out, they were the most expensive. Now they have 8K. I don't know. It looks, the 4K looked as clear as 8K to me, but, you know. So we, we all have that imagery, and, and as a society, we seem to want to have a clearer image of things that are going on. And so certainly a, a picture of things, and they used to say a picture says what? A thousand words. And so certainly some of that we see here in symbolism in the book of Ezekiel. Symbolism has the advantage of expressing truths in colorful and vivid ways. It also has the potential disadvantage of providing a happy hunting ground for a variety of theological speculators who uh, can discover a host of truths in various Narratives for which there is no slightest basis other than the, the perceived uh, preconceived theories which they begin their journey into extiological fantasy land. Symbolism is a, um, a vivid means of conveying divine truth as evidenced by the parables of Jesus in the book of Revelation. It must be approached with the greatest care. In other words, if what it's saying is some people can use their imagination and go off to the left or to the right or, or whichever and, and bring things forth that aren't even true, or you can, um, it can be used in certainly good ways. And we see the symbolism uh, once again in the book of Revelation. So these brief three point outlines as follows Prophet, first, prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, this is the briefest outline that I could find. Some of them have about 142 points in the outline. Uh, I gave you three, so you kind of get a gist of what the book is, is about. So the first 24 chapters are prophecies of destruction of Jerusalem. But within that, we'll see a lot of things. My favorite chapter is chapter three um, in that particular uh, section of scripture there. Divine judgments to come on various nations, 25 to 32, and 33, uh, prophecies of the return to Canaan. So those last few books, remember, there's always hope. The hope comes in the last, the return. Chapter 3 and chapter 33 are mirror chapters of each other. So if I say my favorite chapter is chapter 3, I'm going to say my second favorite is chapter 33. My third fa favorite is chapter 27, the Valley of Dry Bones. So you see that in one, each section of uh, the outline, I have a favorite chapter, if you will. It must be noted that the book has some marvelous prophetic flashings of the coming Messiah, the mountain cedar tree in chapter 17, the showers of blessings in chapter 35, and Jehovah's servant David in chapter 37. So, um, we kind of see that, that type of flavor in all the Old Testament books, but certainly here in the book of Ezekiel. The message delivered by Ezekiel was one of doom. We don't like doom messages, do we? we? Certainly don't. He explained the reason for Judah's captivity in verses 1, chapter 1 through 24. At the same time, his message was one of hope. So you have doom, but yet there's, remember, hope. And, and so certainly we want to hang on to the hope of it. Uh, he has prophesied that, that Judah's restoration was assured. So here's some interesting things here. The, basically, um, what we feel that some of the dates were when certain things happened in the book. Um, the, now, I should explain kind of the way that they date, do dating in this time frame, um, similar to the way we do dating. If I say, what well, was the year that Donald Trump was president? You would say, well, that year is what? 2016 through 2020. So we, we don't really know about the next future, but anyway, we know that much. And, and so that would give us a four year space for that to be. Well, they did much the same thing. The year such and such was king. Well, we knew when he was king, and so we could, you know, base on that, and, and they have um, researchers that, that do all this um, uh, dating and things like that. The prophecies of Ezekiel were presented between 593 and 2 there, means 593 or 592 and 571 or 570 B.C. 
Uh, the book has 13 dates, so we can look at, uh, see in these chapters and verses, 13 dates uh, included, seven of which are dated during oracles against the nations, um, at those chapters 25 through 32, and the remaining ones are chronological order. Uh, John B. Taylor suggests the following uh, precise dates for the oracles in relation to the Julian calendar. So you have those there. So basically, we can say the book started about 593, and the book ended about 573. So how many years would that be? That'd be about 20 years, wouldn't it? And so we have basically a, a 20 year period. Now, notice the dates in this time period go which way? Backwards. They go backwards, downwards, going down to zero. So it gets to 80, and then we'll, we'll start going back up to where we're at in 2020 today. So we see about a 20 year, approximately 20 year period um, in the book there. Now, interesting, because we mentioned before that Ezekiel prophesied for some 22 years, and um, even some things are written about him 27 years. So uh, dating is not always 100% accurate, but uh, you get some kind of gist of it there. The purpose of the book. Why was the book written? Ezekiel's task was to impress upon, that is to prophesy to the exiles the word of the Lord, explaining that their enslavement was due to their own sinfulness. You ever get somebody to say, well, I, why did this happen to me? Why am I here? Why am I going through this in life? Why, why, why? Children say that, don't they, sometimes? Why, 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 why? Ezekiel's job is to tell them what? Why? And it's because when they were in the land where they felt comfortable, they didn't respect the land, they didn't respect who? God. And, and God kept on warning them. It's interesting about God because he is a God that will continue to warn us. So God kept on warning and warning and warning. If you don't, you know, repent, if you don't turn away from your sinful ways, you know, things aren't going to work out for you. Well, we find out that they don't work out, and then they find themselves in a jam, and they're saying, well, why are we here? Well, it's Ezekiel's job to prophesy, to remind them of why they are here. They had committed abominations by their continued worship of idols. Simple as that. Worshiping idols. What is an idol? Exactly. Anything that you put above or separate you from God. So do we have idols in our day and age? Yeah. Yeah. But we certainly do. Um, maybe not all the same kinds that we have, that they had in there, but we certainly do have idols. Therefore, God was bringing upon them a sword. It should be capital G, I'm sorry. Um, you're going to see a lot of capital G's and a lot of small G's. When you're talking about idols, it's a small G. When it's a false god, it's a small G. That should definitely be a capital G. I apologize if that didn't get checked. Let me do that now. That would that drive me nuts. But anyway, therefore God was bringing upon them a sword that would shed their blood, the penalty for their sinfulness. Um, God said that these events Occurred, occurred so that they would know that I am the Lord God. God needs us to understand what? Who he is. That's important. Who is God? And so the book of Ezekiel in some aspects, and I think in very good aspects, will answer who is God. God. Because sometimes even today we have that question, no, but we know we're supposed to do some basic things. Okay, I go to church, I worship God, you know, I become a Christian, I know some basic things that I'm supposed to do, but, but really who is this God that I worship and, and what, what does he do? And, and sometimes we have a couple you know, we think, well, God is just, you know, we, we see verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so God is love. We see John, God is love. We understand, 
Oh, God is kind of like this big Santa Claus guy that just loves everybody. And then we see some Old Testament verses where we see the judgment of God and we get that idea where God is just someone who is who is mean and cranky and old and, 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 and it's the judgment. Well, the truth of all is God is everything. Put together, he is love, he is judgment, he is all these things and more. It's interesting when we think of God that there's nothing I can do in my day that God doesn't know about. Nothing. So everything I do from, you know, it's not from the second I wake up to the second I go to bed. It's from the time I am alive to the time I am dead. God knows every moment of every minute of every day of my life and yours. God is with me all the time. So God knows everything. So it's not like I don't, don't tell God that I'm doing. No, no, God knows. Why do you think he wants us to repent? Because he, he, he knows. So we have the purpose there. Now the theme, uh, the main theme of the book is the person who sins will what? Die. Well, that sounds like on the judgment side. It certainly is. And, and we need to, we need to, you know, so there, there we need to understand all of God. The person who sins will die. So it would be logical, the person who doesn't sin will not die. But to turn, you know, there's a, there's a comma there, but to turn, repent, is to live. So at the same time, if you sin, you'll die, but if you repent, you will live. And so that's really the, 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 the underlying theme of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel set forth individual personal responsibility, a theme not emphasized by other prophets. Um, so he's personalized it, the person. You, me, insert your name there. Now, many of the other prophets would say, okay, I'm going to judge the group Jerusalem or the group, excuse me, the group the Jews or Judah or whoever, I'm going to judge these smaller groups as a group. But here we see an individual, put your name here, stand in front of the mirror here. And so we certainly see it's very personable. It's a responsibility of themes not emphasizing uh, the other prophets. The Israelites, while in captivity, had determined that their captivity was not due to their own sin, but the sins of their fathers. Well, if dad wouldn't have lived his life like this, wouldn't have put me in this situation. I can't say that about my dad, but some people can, I guess. I didn't do anything wrong. Have you ever heard that in our culture? I've done nothing wrong. It must have been because I had bad what? Parents. Isn't that, that is a little bit of our culture today, isn't it? Blame it on my parents. Dad wasn't there, mom wasn't there, whatever, you know. Ezekiel is saying, no, you can't do that. It, it's you. No matter if your parents were good or your parents were bad, you stand at the gate. And, and it's you that have to face the music. And so we'll see in the book of Ezekiel a belief that goes back through certain religious bodies today where they believe you, that you, when you're born, you adopt the sin of your parents. So we'll see through the book of Ezekiel that, that that's not a true fact. You, when you're born, you come out as, as pure and white as snow with, with no sin whatsoever. How can you have sin when you haven't done anything? So you, you come out pure and white as snow, and until you come to the age of accountability um, is when sin becomes involved. Ezekiel reminds them of their own a rebellion against the law of God. And this message of Ezekiel um, emphasized the promise of God's faithfulness in, in carrying out his eternal purpose. And this sinful nation had to die, but, but this remnant would be saved. All right, so we have five additional themes, if you will. 
um, that we see throughout the book. That's the, the dominant theme, and then these are, are kind of side themes. I would call them the holiness of God. Kind of talked about that a little bit. God is holy. In the midst of an evil nation, God's eternal attributes of the righteousness was manifested. So we serve a holy God, a, a God who cannot sin, and, and we need to understand that. Uh, secondly, the sinfulness of Israel. A sinfulness of the nation that we're talking about. The word sin occurs 20 times in the book. Three chapters chronicle Israel's sinfulness. So we have three chapters that just talk about how bad they are. Can you imagine that? You're so bad that I gotta use all these verses to tell how bad you are. That's, that, that, that's not good at all. So it's a sinfulness of, of that particular nation. Of course, we have sinfulness of nations um, in our day and time. So thirdly, God will not allow sinfulness to continue. He will punish sin. I think we've talked about that. Um, we know that the sinner will be punished. Ezekiel's often portrayed Israel's sin as having accumulated until the final cup was full and she would not now receive the extent of God's wrath, which he would spend or pour out. Fourthly, individual responsibility. We've talked about that. While the theme is repeated often in the text, the prophet especially focuses on in it on chapter 18, the person who sins will die. So it's individual responsibility. In our day and age, it's the exact same. You've got a car full of people. The police come around, you get pulled over. It's individual responsibility. They individually want to see your ID, don't they, to every single person in the car. If one individual committed a crime, they won't arrest the whole car, they might hold the whole car, but the one individual will be responsible for the crime. So it's individual responsibility. We have that um, where we stand before God today as individuals. And fifthly, the good news of God will restore. The forgiving nature of God is a beautiful illustration. God's righteousness requires punishment, but his compassion allowed forgiveness and restoration. The truth is not powerful illustrated in the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. So that's chapter 37, 27, it's actually 37 there. So the, the dry bones. Another key idea that is here is the spirit or the glory leaving and returning. He left the temple in chapter 8 through 11 and returned in chapter 43. He left, uh, there was judgment, he returned after there's restoration. And so we see that some background uh, information, historical background, and then we'll be ready for chapter one in the little time we have left. Uh, the, the remarkably swift turn of events, the Babylonians uh, disposed of the powerful Assyrians in 612 BC. The shift of power had profound impact on Judah, and Ezekiel would have been a witness to many changes that were taking place. I don't know how to best explain this other than you have a superpower like Russia or China and another nation comes in and wipes them out, takes their power away and becomes, I don't know, pick a nation. Um, Iraq comes into China, wipes them out, and now that all becomes Iraq. Um, that's pretty much what happened here. And, and God is actually behind this whole power shift, this move for the purpose of punishing um, the, the nation of, of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel had been a witness to those changes, but during his lifetime, five kings reigned with Josiah being the most noteworthy king. So Josiah, you're famous here. I think this is probably where your name came from. Is that right? Yeah, there you go. He ruled from 640 to 609 BC. Um, he was a, Josiah was a good king. Not all the, I think these, not all these kings were good kings. Uh, jo, uh, Jehoahaz, um, 609 BC, he did not have long, he did not even have a whole year. He's also called uh, Shemuel. Uh, Jehoiakim, uh, I believe uh, related to, to Jehoiachin, and finally uh, Zedekiah. And so we see those five kings here in his lifetime. So let's look at verse 1 on the little time we have left here this evening. We've got about five minutes. In the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month. So we have, what we'll see here is we have an account, Ezekiel's account, 
of his prophecies beginning with a narrative uh, about the visions of God. We see a timeline here in the 13th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day. So that's, that's a, basically that is a calendar marking uh, of when this took place. He said, Ezekiel would say, as I, Ezekiel, was among the exiles by the cherub uh, now. Uh, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. So we see some notes here um, in the text about verse 1 and 2. Uh, Ezekiel's account of his prophecies began in narrative about his visions of God. These visions occurred in the 13th year. Uh, Bible historians have counted backwards from the fifth year of Jehoiachin's exile arriving at the eighth year of Josiah's reign when he found the book of the law. If you remember Josiah, Josiah was the one, the, basically the Bible was lost for uh, many years, if you will. And he was the king that found it. Where did he find it? All the places in the building, if you will, in the temple. Um, what you know? Somebody left the Bible at church. <laughs> and what well, wasn't that type of church back then, but, you know, in the temple. And so um, he was kind of famous for that, kind of famous by opening it and saying, hey, let's follow these things in in the Bible. So Ezekiel apparently received this vision and his commission in the year that he began his priestly service. Um, God involved Ezekiel in a ministry immediately upon his becoming a priest, and we are allowed to witness the work of Ezekiel from the first commission. The statement, I saw a vision in the first direct claim of his inspired book. So in other words, it's Ezekiel's writing, I saw. Um, we see their visions came to Ezekiel by the river uh, Cherbar, a minor river or canal in Babylonia. The location of the Cherbar uh, it can be identified by the Babylonian uh, Nara, how do you say that, Kebara, and it was between uh, Bab Babylon and Nuclear. And so we kind of get the location there um, from the river. Verse 2. Uh, on the fifth of the month, in the fifth year, King Jehoiachin's exile. So more of the dating. Uh, as we look on to verse 3, the word of the Lord came to me expressly to Ezekiel the priest. So from that we learn that who is talking to him? God is talking to him. Uh, the word of the Lord came to him expressly, which was that word expressly mean? Him alone. Him alone. Here I'm talking to several people here and, and several people online. In this situation, it would be to Ezekiel alone if I delivered a, a secret message to Josiah or something. It would be to him alone. And so this word is coming to Ezekiel alone. Um, we see in verse 3, the Lord came to me expressly to Ezekiel, the priest. And so there's his position. Now, when we think about this, and here it's in your notes about him being a priest, let me see if I can find that. Maybe later. Yeah. Okay, the phrase Ezekiel priest, yeah, is presently seeing some grammatical, um, you know, the phrase the priest could either be referring to the father or the son. It doesn't seem, though, that Ezekiel himself was a priest. Uh, this makes two sections especially significant. Um, we think that when you see the priest there, we think that uh, they're saying, um, this commentator is saying it's not. Uh, in chapter 4, when Ezekiel's asked to eat unclean foods, well, a priest wouldn't be asked to eat unclean foods, so it makes it a little difficult there. Chapter 8, where Ezekiel is taken into a vision to see abominations associated with the temple in Jerusalem. Um, I guess a priest can see abominations, but it's not uh, always that good. He's described as a sign different places by his action, what Yahweh is to bring upon his people is already present. The prophet belongs inseparably to the message. So verse 1 through 3 provides evidence of Ezekiel's divine call. The heavens were open. I saw the vision. The word of the Lord came expressly. And the hand of the Lord came upon him. We see that in verse uh, 3. And so we see that it's God talking to uh, the prophet Ezekiel. So we are out of time for today. I appreciate your uh, your patience and attendance. And um, as we
As we look at the book of Ezekiel, we'll continue, Lord willing, we'll continue on with verse 4 and beyond uh, next uh, Wednesday night. Zach will have our devotional in just a second. The song of invitation is number six, six seventy five. Five, six seventy five. We'll be on the screen behind me in just a moment. Uh, some updates on our announcements. We never have a pen up here. Just stick some pens under here. Um, remember, Paul, limit your prayers. He's dealing with health concerns. He continues to deal with health concerns. Uh, Karen Mance is. As we reported, she's suffering from that uh, LPR. She did make it to her niece's house in, down south and is doing well there. Uh, Tiffany Dickerson had a biopsy last Friday. She uh, will not find out both herself for about another week yet. So keep Tiffany in your prayers for good results. Stacy White's brother, uh, Charles White, has throat cancer and he's having surgery December 1st to remove uh, his tumor. So. Um, that's coming up quickly, so remember uh, Charles White in your prayers. He has that surgery. Um, Mike Carpenter has not been feeling very good, and he's uh, tested, uh, or he's waiting for his COVID results. He was tested the other day, has not got his results back yet. Uh, please remember our shut ins. Um, Dr. West and Helen, they ended, and uh, they're doing pretty, pretty good right now. They have some leaves to, to get up. Maybe wants to help West help with some leaves, but uh, they're doing pretty good. Uh, continue to remember Diane Knox, and she fights cancer. And uh, she is showing uh, that she does have no brain cancer at this time, so that's good news. Uh, Janice Martin's brother, Dale, uh, has con cancer in his prostate. He'll be having more testing and surgery, I think it's January 5th, early in January. Uh, Rhonda Facemeyer's son has um, been fighting COVID. I believe he has gone back to work, but his wife, Tracy, is uh, not doing well. She's uh, had COVID and been to the uh, hospital a couple times. Right now, the hospitals are three times capacity in their ICU units, both on both, on both sides of the river. So they're encouraging you, if you get sick, don't go to the hospital because they, they will just send you away, most likely. Uh, Jason Riggs, that's a friend of Ann and I's, um, he's been extremely sick with COVID-19. He has what other? Yeah. MS. He has MS, and so that doesn't help when you have underlying conditions like that. And now his daughter, Jasmine, um, is sick with the COVID. Uh, some good news, Connie Stevens got her results back, so she did test negative for that. Uh, Joyce and John Carter have been exposed and are now in quarantine waiting their results. They were tested today or yesterday, I don't remember. Uh, Gina Oates, this is Liam's grandmother, other grandmother, Mark's mom, has been tested positive for COVID and needs prayers. Beth uh, uh, Settle has breast cancer. And Robin uh, Chinsnell, Stacy White's sister, uh, had a stroke and her body is uh, rejecting a transplant artery um, to save her leg. And so keep, uh, keep Robin in your prayers and Beth and all those in our prayer list. Is there anybody else? Okay, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, so everybody have a happy Turkey Day. Um, the ladies, December 1st is Ladies Digging Deep Class podcast that is online. The ladies night out has been uh, canceled because of all the outbreaks of COVID at this current time. And December 7th will be elders and deacon, or elders and preachers meeting here at the building, I assume, at 6.30. And so Zach will have our devotional. Let, let, just before we uh, get into the invitation, um, I know what some people's opinion is. And once again, as a congregation, we need to decide how we're going to handle the COVID outbreak, which is more severe than it ever has been. So I would just simply like to ask you, what is your opinion? Should we continue to gather together or should we restrict services? Anybody? Stay here, have service. 
Oui. Well, here's what do you think, Stacy? Oh, I think that he's. Um, I, I get more out of coming to church than what I actually do in there. Well, I, I'm and, sure we can all agree with that. I, I, there's just there's no doubt in him that's way better. Stacy, Christine. Here's my issue. I got a preacher who is in the severely shouldn't probably be in category with his heart condition and his other health issues. And so his wife is very concerned, very understandable that he's risking his life when he comes in here to do this. And so I want you guys to realize that these are some of the things that we take into consideration when we make decisions whether we should have services or not. And since you are the only ones here, that's the reason why I'm asking you. Well, whenever it boils all down to it, if it's only threatening somebody's life or something like that, it's a sin. I mean, you know, we don't want to take a chance like that. I don't either. So, I mean, but at the same time, <clears throat> you know, it's not just having spiritual strength, it's not the other thing that works for the other reason. No substitute for that. Uh, thank you, guys. I, I would like to make this comment. I completely understand Elvis's concern, and Anne's. And uh, if, if they get to the point where they feel they will need to take a little hiatus, I think they should. I do too. And we, I think, you know, we, we, we I think that should be made known. Yes. I mean, we, we do on occasion anyway, you know? Yeah. And if anybody has a problem with it, then that's their problem. Well, I'm, I'm an experienced. But if people are exposed, they can quarantine at home. I agree. Yeah. And I mean, that's. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you would, turn with me to the book of Psalms. And we'll be looking at one particular psalm this evening Psalm 23. Psalm 23. I remember when I was just a well, shorter, smaller, younger version of myself than I am now. Uh, the very first verse that I ever memorized, or the very first verses that I ever memorized, was Psalm 23. Because the lovely lady, Miss Imogene, over at Marlo Vincent, she told Ben and I that she would make us a plate of cookies if we got up in front of the church and we recited these verses. And so for a very sweet deal, I memorized these verses way back then. And since then, I think I've had to write them out for various different reasons. But uh, the other week, I was, there was a lot going on, and I woke up one morning, and you know, I got a message from one of my friends that basically a group of people that we had been around for an extended period of time, a few of the people had tested positive or were exhibiting symptoms and tested positive. And of course, that, that gave me some anxiety amongst everything else going on. Whether it be COVID, whether it be the situation of our nation and so many other things, it's, it's really easy, no matter what, to let a lot of things get in the way of why we should be thankful. And I was thinking about this because, you know, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and among any other of the Thanksgivings that I've ever experienced, and I'm sure that a lot of us have, it's, it's harder this year than many others to look around and just be joyful, to be happy without seeing something that upsets us or worries us or gets us fired up in some way that's not positive. And I really think that these verses, these six verses, go to show a lot of the reasons why we even should be joyful or thankful to begin with. So read with me in Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now these six few verses were written in the Psalm of David. And he experienced a lot of turmoil. You see that the lives of God's people have never been one that has been calm or peaceful. There's always something going on. Whether it be someone trying to threaten the nation of Israel. To enslave the nation of Israel. Or Christians being persecuted. Or Jews under Roman occupation. If you look through the Bible, it's not just a series of tales that show us things and give us truth about how we should live our lives, but it shows us that the lives of people in general and God's people have never been one of calm state, but that doesn't mean that they ever were short on things to give thanks for. And sure, David absolutely struggled with joy. He ever absolutely struggled with anxiety. When he was hiding in the cave to evade Saul, a man who wanted to kill him, I think it'd be crazy to say that David wasn't worried for his life in those moments. But he focused on God to do those things. And so let's walk through these six verses shortly as we, as we discuss these things and we think about thankfulness. David says, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In this moment, David is making himself to be a sheep. He is saying that the Lord is the shepherd. He is the one who takes care of me. He is the one that helps me find nourishment because the shepherd is the one that brings the sheep to the, to the fields, the ones that, that brings them into the meadow so that they can graze, so that they can be there. But also, the shepherd is the one who protects his sheep. And you can see that metaphor all through the New Testament as well. But David says that he is my shepherd. That should be an encouraging thing, that even for something like an animal, like a sheep, it's very simple-minded, David says that the Lord is that to me. He is the one who protects me. And not only that, but he says that I shall not want. I shall not want. There are no overarching desires for David because of who is around him, who is taking care of him. Regardless of what David can do to influence the situation. Because no matter what was going on in David's life, he knew that God was the one that was there. And he says why he shall not want. He goes on to explain that in verse 2. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. <coughs> he, he brings him to where he needs to be. The green pastures are obviously the places where you get the most from if you're a grazing animal. And David said that God, he brings me there. He gives me the best of what I need and all of what I need. And he says that he leads me beside still waters. Calms. Tranquility. Those are the things that define David's relationship with God. Not things that are unstable or anxiety-ridden. That, that is not the relationship that David has with God. It is one of peace and comfort. And obviously it doesn't mean that David didn't experience those things. But that is not who God is and who that relationship gives to him. Or what that relationship gives to David. And in verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. In the wisdom of when this was written, God understood that we weren't people that could just check a box of, hey, I'm, I've done what is right. I've checked that box. But that we are more like batteries when it comes to our salvation. That in our faith, in our belief, in our strength, spiritually. It's not just a yes, I was baptized. Yes, I believe in the Bible. Yes, I believe in Jesus. We need to be restored. We need to be charged up in our joy, in our salvation. That's why David said, and please create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Because he knows that things can change and that throughout the days, throughout the weeks, throughout the years, that we need to be restored and we need to be brought back to a certain state. And God does that for us, as Elvis was talking about. But also, it says that in verse 3, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
See, we can choose what paths we go, but if you're a sheep and you're following your shepherd, you let him direct you. And he says that he is the one that leads them in paths of righteousness. Why? Because they are for his name's sake. They aren't for another reason. And with everything going on, we can pick dozens of reasons to do something, to say something, or to go a certain way. But David shows that the paths that are worth walking, that help us be thankful, are only those that are for his name's sake, and not for other things. David continues in verse 4, and he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this was interesting because when I read this before, I knew what a rod and staff were, but specifically the tools that are being discussed here are the two instruments that shepherds use to direct and keep their sheep. That is this language that David is using, and quite brilliantly, because when we come to the New Testament, Jesus is that sheep. And he says, though, that he is also the shepherd. And so in this moment, David is saying that even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, David knew he had to die one day. But he knew that he wouldn't fear the things that were coming for his life or fear the things around him. Whether it be leaders of nations, whether it be wild animals or giants that he had to face, he wasn't going to fear those things because his shepherd was the one who was keeping him on the path with the tools that he had to bear. And he said that they comfort him. At the end of the day, when we, when we sit amidst everything going on and we are completely present, when we think of our salvation and our shepherd, that is when the comfort comes. When we let everything else come in the way and those thoughts pile up, that's when it becomes difficult and we need to be restored. We need to be by still waters. But our shepherd has given us those tools. And David continues to elaborate on this comfort. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, you prepare a table a place that is of fellowship, where you eat, where you sit, that is comfort. But in the presence of enemies, those who would seek to destroy you, he's saying that that is, that is the comfort, that is the level that he's at with his relationship with God and in his joy of his own relationship. But also you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. He knew that he was blessed richly. I mean, you don't get to be a man like David who is a valiant man of war, and also a man of God, without recognizing that you are blessed. And he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is our wish. Surely we don't need good things or positive things all around us to know that goodness and mercy will follow us if we have put on Christ, if we are living to be his children. Because that is where goodness and mercy flows. They don't come from being blessed here on this earth with material things or possessions or good fortune here. Because it is the dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. That house is what we should be focusing on. And as we go into this time of thankfulness and especially this season of, you know, I mean, it's the good feeling time of year, you know, all the holly jolly Christmas carols and all the lovely things, but it's the eternity that is the, the most wonderful gift that we have and those blessings that we can be most thankful for. So as we go into this time, you know, this time of year and we leave and we go back out, not really into the world too much these days, but I encourage you to focus and meditate for yourself personally. Be present in the moment and focus on the things that God has given you and has blessed you with. And just do, just call some people. Reach out to some people. The little things that we can do are better than nothing. And any time that we need to be not only there for ourselves, for our own spiritual health, but there for others to help them through these times, it's now. And so I encourage you, whether it be these six verses or other passages of Scripture this week, find some and just sit down and meditate on them solely. Let those be fully present and think on those things. If you have any needs, if you have any 
desires at all. We're here to be together as a family spiritually and always hear one another as God's people. So please come as we stand and as we sing. Uh, please open your talk book number 675 if you haven't already. For those that haven't, I know a few of you already have. 675, I am resolved. 675. I am resolved no longer to linger, charm by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my soul. Please help us have safe travels to our home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.